Hey guys, this is Kamil Rückert from the Psychosomatic Student Group Riga and today I would like to talk to you about a question a lot of people ask and even some medical students tend to ask this quite often. Is psychosomatics even real? And I guess what they're actually referring to is the question, is there a physiological basis for psychosomatics? Or do you think the mind can influence the body? So let me start by saying yes it is and yes it can and in this short lecture I'm going to explain it to you. But first let's start with a little quite interesting history lesson. The history of the mind and illness can be divided into three parts. Before the 19th century and then there's a break referred to as the age of insight and the period after the 20th century. So. As long as medical history can remember, there has always been a connection between mental processes and illness. Early doctors knew that the given examples, such as a loss of fortune, death, or a specific unspecific disappointment, could lead to an illness. And while this was great to see, they unfortunately saw this emphasized in Gallen's theories. The problem with Gallen is that he was a double-edged sword. On the one hand, he um, did not really believe in a distinction between the mind and the body, and he even believed in a primitive form of psychotherapy. Yet, on the other hand, Gallen's theories were based on four fluids and their equilibrium towards each other. There was yellow bile, black bile, blood and phlegm. And he attributed different personality types to an inequilibrium of those fluids. And to say it quite polemically, it really all led to bloodletting and that really didn't work. And even though these theories had been around since 170 AD, they commonly or occasionally were still used in the 19th century. And luckily the age of insight began in Vienna, a term Eric Kendall uses to describe a period of intense changes in science, medicine and art. It was a period of some improvements in nearly all areas. So Rudolf Virchow started this new science of cellular pathology, which led to his theory that all diseases had to have a pathological change on a cellular level. And during the same time his colleague Karl van Rokitansky connected systematically clinical findings with pathological findings. And thereby these two figures improved medical science forever. But unfortunately, for the sake of science, they also excluded mental and emotional problems from pathologies. And they did this to concentrate on the cellular pathology or pathogenesis and pathology. And this was really, to say, a disguise and a blessing. But again, luckily Virchow and von, von Rukitansky's ideas were soon applied by other doctors. Because what Rokitansky said was, we need to look beyond the outer appearance to explore the truth. And while he was talking about patho pathology in connection to the disease and illness, early psychiatrists and other doctors interested in the mind, like Freud, Breuer, soon realized that one really has to look beyond the outer appearance to see the true source of illness which they regarded as not only cellular, but also uh, mental. They thereby influenced psychiatry and neurology and really also internal me medicine immensely. And Freud obviously started his theory of psychoanalysis. So thereby, the disguise and a blessing really turned into a blessing not only by improving modern medicine, but also by forming a theory of the mind and an early theory of why the mind influenced the body. And after the 20th century, Freud's psychoanalytic theories slowly became omnipresent in medicine. Georg Grodek and Viktor von Weizsäcker influenced internal medicine in Europe and especially in Germany. While slowly in the 50s and 70s, the new medical profession of um, psychosomatic medicine and psychotherapy was formed and started to gain acceptance among medical professions and among the public. So, 
let's start with the interesting question of can the mind influence the body? Um, I will explain this question based on three topics. To begin with, the stress and fear response, followed by a genetic component, and psychoimmunology. But let's start by asking a question to you. Can you think of any psychosomatic symptom? Or of any time that the mind influenced the body? Maybe you remember a time in which you were quite stressed. Let's say before an exam. And I'll give you a couple of seconds to think about it. Or if you need longer, just stop this video. So maybe you thought of the right stress responses. Because every time I'm stressed before an exam, those exact problems mentioned here happen to me. I start to sweat, my pulse is going crazy, and unfortunately I need to run to the restroom quite often, or let's say occasionally. So all of this is due to the autonomic nervous system, which is activated by a fight and flight response, or sorry, which actually leads to a fight and flight response. H. Sully describes stress as a non-specific performance increasing response of the body to any demand placed on it. And basically what we call stress in the common language or let's say an exam is a demand and we want to act on it. And already you can see a little hint why psychosomatic diseases or illness might develop. Because in our civil society, running away or fighting our stress inducers is really not working. And in order to explain the stress response, we need to look at the neuroanatomy of the brain. And here's a little picture I drew for you guys, and I hope you can recognize these four structures. There's the hypothalamus, the hypophysis, hippocampus, and the amygdala. And all of these structures are referred to as the limbic system and play a key role in the stress and fear response. And we could really go on about each structure and function, but I think it would be too much, uh, going too much into depth. So this is a simplified version of the fear and stress axis, but really enough to understand the mechanism. In the center of this response, you can find the amygdala. And it is really the key component in this reaction. Fear and other emotions lead to an immediate activation of the autonomic uh, nervous system via the amygdala going straight to the spinal cord as seen on the right. And on the other hand, the amygdala activates the hypothalamus, which itself releases CRH corticotropin-releasing hormone. CRH leads again to the activation of the autonomic nervous system and activates ACTH in the hypophysis, or in the pituitary gland, which is really just a different word for it. ACTH stands for adrenocorticotropic hormone. As you can imagine by the name, it acts on the adrenal hormones, thereby releasing cortisol from the cortex of the adrenal gland and adrenaline and noradrenaline from the medulla of the adrenal gland. And these two hormones have an important effect of, on the body, increasing its metabolism, slowing the immune system and activating the effector system. The activation of these three systems thereby leads to physically felt stress. But how does stress transform to psychosomatic symptoms? Well, Psychosomatic symptoms usually develop in case of long-term exposure, when the stress is not time-limited and thereby not overcome. This often leads to a feeling of helplessness or the depressive symptoms, which unfortunately trigger the release of the known hormones CRH, ACTH and cortisol. In addition to this long-term exposure of stress leads to an increased gene expression responsible for a higher sensitivity towards stressors, as well as an increase in the hormone production. So the more these hormones are activated, the more the genes are expressed, which leads to the damage of the limbic system, and unfortunately, thereby to a vicious cycle. And in order for you to memorize and to visualize this one more time, I drew a little picture illustrating the events of long-term 
um, exposure to stress. And you may take a moment to look at it and pause the video to really understand the dramatic effect of long-term stress since it always leads to this vicious cycle. In conclusion, stress and fear lead to a cascade of hormone release, which influence our metab metabolism, immune system and effector system. Long-term exposure of those hormones damages the limbic system, which shuts down the inhibitory system by becoming hypersensitive, leading to a vicious circle. Secondly, we should talk about the genetic component of psychosomatic illness. While genetics itself shows us the unfolding of proteins responsible for the development of disease, one of the most interesting findings of the last years is the science of epigenetics. Epigenetics is just a term used for the activation or deactivation of genes by methylation. This process can be triggered by two main factors. On the one hand, we have general factors such as aging, dieting, environmental factors or pharmaceuticals. And on the other hand, we have developmental factors, such as in uterus, meaning during pregnancy, and childhood factors. And this is really amazing because it states that given your general genetic database, your life choices and circumstances still play a major role in the development of disease. So let's talk about the childhood factors, stress and neglect. Because we all know the stereotype of the neglected child becoming really ill and having mental problems, emotional problems. And this is unfortunately true. And since everything here is based on research, and it would be foolish to believe me as I'm just a student, each number here you can see... Um, stands for a cited study and you can find the source at the end of my little lecture. So what does stress and neglect do to children or in childhood? Two things we already know due to the stress and fear response. It leads to a worse immune system and a lower tolerance for stress. And this stress tolerance unfortunately does two things. Uh, it leads to a higher risk of suicide and to a higher risk for stress-induced depression. And also research shows that it leads to the development of autoimmune diseases, or it makes the development much more likely. So how is all of this possible? Well, these traumatic experiences lead to a psychological scar, meaning genes responsible for our anti-stress response become silent. The NR3C1 gene is the anti-stress gene. Yet, the effects can be reversed, but that's probably a topic for another lecture titled Does Psychotherapy Even Work? And some of you might ask, um, why did I write Freud into bra in brackets? And it's really just to remind myself that the parent-child relationship is at the core of this psychoanalysis. And a healthy mother-child relationship is beneficial. So epigenetics leaves us with two conclusions. First, not inheritance, but the quality of mother-child relationship influences the gene's effectiveness. And second, the methylation is reversible. And this little bracket here is supposed to emphasize that obviously it doesn't need to be a mother, but more like a motherly figure. And a third important contributor to epigenetics can already be found during late pregnancy. A study states that depression in late pregnancy leads to an already methylated NR3C1 gene in newborns. And they unfortunately have high cortisol values even three months after birth. So babies of depressed moms already have a stress response. So, going through the studies on epigenetics, we can really make the following conclusions. Early childhood trauma and malignant relationships lead to changes in the brain and genes of children. 
and this leads to an increased lifelong risk for psychosomatic disorders due to a lower stress tolerance. For example, depression, generalized anxiety, or the psychosomatic pain. And last but not least, let's, uh, let's look at the topic of psychoimmunology. And did you ever wonder why do I get sick and none of my friends? Or did you ever wonder why do I always get sick after a stressful time? Maybe during your well-earned holidays. And this is really because not only your physical constitution is responsible for your immune system, but also psychosocial factors. By now, a variety of studies have been conducted on the link between the mind and infections. And two of those studies state that the risk for common cold infections is one to five times higher in case of stress or felt stress. And that pessimistic people have a significantly lower immune system than so-called optimists. And this is just really amazing that you can already see how the mind can influence the body, which is really what psychosomatic stands for, the mind and the body. And luckily, optimism and calmness can be learned by mindfulness meditation or by other relaxation techniques, and it thereby improves the immune system. And I just realized that probably here there should have been a study about uh, psychotherapy and its effect on uh, common cold infections, or maybe on the general immune response. But maybe that's really for the next lecture. So, how does uh, what's the physiological base for this? Well, let's take a look at the picture I drew again, and let's focus on the right side. As we already know, stress does activate cortisol. And in case of long-term exposure of stress, the cortisol values are elevated. Cortisol has an effect on the interleukins by lowering their production. And if you don't know what interleukins are, interleukins are just cytokines. And cytokines themselves are cell modulators in the immune response. So lowering interleukins or lowering the interleukin level therefore leads to a decreased immune response. And if we take a look at the left side, we can see two opposing arrows uh, to symbolize that not only the brain influences the immune system, vice versa, the immune system influences the mental state. And just think of fever and how you feel when you have it, or just uh, when you feel terribly tired from any illness. The brain can not only work on the immune system by means of cortisol as seen on the right, but it can also work on it by CRH, by nervus vagus, and by the autonomic nervous system. And each of these three um, lower the immune cell count and thereby indirectly influence humans to being prone to infections. And also, and I unfortunately made a little mistake here, Chronic stress and negative effects increase the action of inflammation influencing antibodies and thereby inflammatory bowel syndrome or allergies and autoimmune uh, diseases develop too. So as this third conclusion in psychoimmunology, we can really say the brain and the immune system influences, influence each other. Stress and negative effect or emotions lead to a low immune response. And this effect, effect can be transversed by relaxation techniques such as meditation. And if you're wondering about my sources, here are five books I worked with. And unfortunately, three of them are German books, so they're only for German students or very, very ambitious English-speaking students. And here you can find my sources for epigenetics. Um, just pause the video if you're interested. And here are my sources for psychoimmunology. So let me thank everybody for listening. And always keep in mind the German poet Schiller, who wrote, It is the mind which builds the body.